Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski. Welcome to my studio. Today, we're going to recreate another painting by another one of my favorite artists today um, in a celebration or in honor of Easter and the uh, Easter break and Good Friday. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, the crucifixion of Jesus from uh, as uh, imagined by William Blake, the arguably the greatest British artist of all time, as part of his series of artworks for the book uh, of illustrations and poem called Jerusalem. And uh, this is, I love this artwork. I love William Blake. He's definitely one of the most unusual, if not like the most unusual artist in the history of art. Um, and certainly this might look a little bit different than any other crucifixion image you've seen in the past. We'll get into why that is, what's going on here, as far as I understand it. <laughs> uh, so let's let's uh, let's jump right into it. Here, let's uh, look at the plan of attack today. We're gonna get the image onto the canvas, and then we're going to stain it with some color. We're gonna talk about uh, William Blake's biography. I'm gonna actually kind of break it into two segments because we're going to do another painting on Sunday um, for the resurrection of Jesus, a separate painting we'll look at here momentarily. We'll do a little bit of an underpainting, uh, and then background, foreground, background, foreground, probably background, a bunch of... And, you know, in all honesty, this is going to be one of the longer ones. If I can get it done in under four hours, that would be a miracle. So buckle up, we'll be here for a while. Um, just as a quick uh, suggestion, a friendly reminder perhaps to like the video if you're watching right now. Hit the subscribe button and also the notification button so you know when uh, videos like this that are kind of spontaneously being recorded uh, and streamed are happening. Uh, also, if you want to support the channel with a small donation, you can use uh, make a donation through PayPal through the super chat function, although YouTube takes like 40% of whatever you donate. So probably your best bet would be to send an e-transfer or PayPal. Uh, contact me via my email or the Facebook group um, if you want to, to send an old fashioned check in the mail, etc. So let's, uh, let's look here. Again, this is the, the painting we're doing today. This is the painting we're doing on Sunday. Um, so, let's go, oops, let's go to the very top here. Okay, so our, what we want to do is get this image onto the canvas. And, you know, it is a pretty complex image. So, you know, if you were to try to sketch that out, you, um, you might have difficulty. Unless, of course, you take my free drawing class. The link is for that down below here on YouTube. Uh, but here's the outline, the free outline I've done on my iPad Pro using the Procreate app. And, you know, when it gets all printed out, it kind of looks like this. Where do you find this amazing thing? And, oh, won't you know, it's free. Well, sorry, here's the Facebook group. Join the Facebook group. I do a free um, uh, feedback session about once every month, month and a half or so. Anyway, you click the Dropbox link in the description below. You'll see the, the, the resources for our introductory episodes, how to mix color, what to paint, or to, what to buy to paint. Uh, etc. are all there. And then we have the next, I don't know, 150 episodes here are all uh, for our, our little bit more simple paintings. To, and then you'll see the next couple hundred episodes or folders here are for more complex paintings. Where are we? We're down here, 153. Of course, in some of these folders, there are two, three, four, five, ten different paintings in there. So, uh, lots to keep you busy. You could spend some time going through all those folders. Anyway, these the resurrection is what we're doing on Sunday. The crucifixion, or these top three here, this is the original artwork, and then a JPEG and a PDF of the outline itself. So let's get this started. So I am going to paint this on a 9 by 12 sized canvas board. I like these ones, these Fix Smiths I've ordered off of Amazon. They come wrapped in plastic. I take the plastic off and then I coat them with a um, one layer of acrylic gesso, um, white acrylic gesso. 
and then I sand it down. So now it's nice and smooth. There, there's still some texture on there, but not nearly as much as when you first open one of these up. And why that is so helpful is if we're gonna do little details like this, having a smoother surface will make your life so much easier. Anytime we do figurative work and there's, um, it's like faces and things, especially when they're smaller, Oh my goodness, you, you'd be surprised how much of a lifesaver that little bit of gesso is to, to smooth that surface. Okay, so we got that on. Now we're going to take some carbon transfer paper. This is actually graphite transfer paper that I've just put in this old folder here. So they do exactly the same thing. Different materials, same results. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to trace all the way around here. It's going to take me a few minutes. But I'm not going to do all the details. And many of these details I'm just going to go by really quickly because we're going to paint over virtually everything here. So the less kind of um, fixated you are on keeping these details in all the little tiny lines intact, probably the easier of a job you'll have working on this painting. Um, there's also all these radiating lines coming out of the, or surrounding the, the body of Jesus here. I'm not going to do all of them. I'll do a few of them, but uh, as long as I've got the basic composition in place, meaning the basic location of where these details are, such as like the knees, for instance, then all the rest can be sort of worked out. Like there's all these little toes and stuff, like I don't like, that is really tricky to do, so we might get to a place where we're just going to have, like, a, a foot and not, you know, detailed toes and everything in here. And that's okay. And also, my uh, carbon paper might not be doing the best job, because, you know, I use my carbon paper over and over and over again. So... Um, that's also going to kind of reduce some of the details. And then just some of the details of the oak tree here. You know, which is obviously very different than the biblical story of Jesus, where he's on a cross. And so I'm sure there's people wondering what on earth is going on here. <laughs> um, that's a good question. It's something people have been trying to figure out since the day this artwork was made. Uh, let me just get a ruler to do some of these radiating lines here. Again, notice I'm not doing all of them.
Okay. So I'll keep this just out of, uh, not out of sight, but just off to the side here because I like to refer to it as I'm working on it. Um, I love that this is just right here. This is a great book. This is by William Blake. But let's let's talk about that here in a moment. <laughs> I, was, I was texting a friend earlier today. I'm like, I've been doing all this research for lately, putting together this episode. Have you, I think you're aware of William Blake, right? Like, what do you think? He's like, I gave you that orange book. Of course I'm into... I'm like, oh, yes, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so... Let's, I'm going to put some of this yellow down on there, let's put it on here, I'm going to put this paint on my palette here, before I move on to my next step. talk about all these colors here in a moment. Okay, so let's go to my next step. Okay, so our next step is to apply a little stain onto the cover or to onto the canvas so that um, uh, we kind of obliterate the scary white surface of the painting. Now, um, I'll let you know just right off the bat that the process that I use for doing all of these paintings, all 276 of them so far, and there's been many more than that, those are just the number of episodes, um, is I'm using what we call split primary palette, and that involves just eight tubes of paint. So there's two yellows, two reds, two blues, a white, and there, I do have a tube of black paint, but I like to mix my own black, and here's the recipe. We'll, we'll be doing it a number of times today, so we'll go over that here shortly. But you'll notice, because there's two yellows, two reds, two blues, we got one that's cool and one that's warm. All colors have a temperature, so they're either warm or cool. If, you, if you've never heard of that before, go watch one of the earlier episodes in the Master Study series, and that explains everything. It uh, maybe sounds more comp... Well, some people find it really complicated to wrap their head around. I think once you get it, everything just makes sense. But anyway, uh, the paint that I'm about to use um, for my Imprimatura is called this Azo Yellow Deep by Amsterdam. It's a warm yellow. Now... This is, I've not, I'm not sponsored or paid by anybody. No one gave me any free supplies. I went and bought them just like everybody else. Um, but, uh, so if you want, if you don't have that brand, you can use, you, you can just find a, like analogous colors um, uh, that are not analogous colors, but, but paints that are, that share similar properties, similar um, values and colors. Uh, but here's Golden, here's Liquitex, Windsor & Newton, Artist Loft, Buzz, Peebo, Holbein, Dyler Rowney, Febacryl, Nova Color, and Chroma Color, but not Museum Color because they put way too much um, white, uh, titanium, titanium white into the paint as a filler and it just, it, it, I don't know why they do that. That's just, that's crazy because it makes it impossible to mix a black. You can only get like a, a, a light gray out of all these paints. So 
Um, and I went through that very quickly, that list. Obviously, earlier in the in earlier episodes, we go through that in more um, in more in depth. So, let's uh, look at this process here. I'm going to put some water. Oops, maybe not that much. This is the only time I use water when I'm painting with acrylic. Although many people do use water, it's probably not. You know, it's it's certainly not advised by the manufacturer. But there's, uh, you know, there's. Nothing will happen to you. Know, you won't get arrested or thrown in jail if you do. But it's, and I've certainly in earlier episodes I have used water in our in the very very basic introductory because most people use water when they're learning to paint because probably they learned how to paint by painting with watercolors. Um, but today we're going to be using a lot of medium. Um, um, probably the glazing medium, because what we're going to be essentially doing is trying to replicate the watercolor look that um, William Blake is so famous for using. Um, William Blake, he did make paintings on panel and canvas, but he's really primarily known as a printer and drawer, and he made, he had his own printing press, and printed his own books and bound them himself and often hand painted them using watercolor and ink. So um, we want to try to capture that particular kind of quality and so that's going to mean trying to get the paint to look a little bit more transparent than, um, than acrylic will sort of looks you know when it comes right out of the tube. So I'm just going both ways here so that I can uh, really make sure that this paint gets into the, the weave. And I don't have any white kind of coming through. Now obviously William Blake printed this image onto Kind of a what? Well, who knows? Is it? It looks like a cream, a cream piece of paper today. Um, is was it always a cream piece of paper, or did it has it yellowed over time? I, I don't know. Good question, Michael. Oh, really? Well, thank you very much for for saying so. Oh, you're you're welcome here. Always have great questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Ah, there's Aji Boy says, hi, Mark. You mean Michael, right? People often get that wrong, but it's okay. Um, still in my beginner drawing playlist, just checking in. Anyways, bye. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks for saying hello. Um, Deborah says, hi, Michael. We got our power back last night after losing it from the ice storm. About half an hour ago, we just got our internet back. It came on just to say hi. Um, uh, Deborah also says, William Blake is one of my favorite authors. He certainly challenged the established church. His paintings are very unique. For sure. Definitely. As we'll see here, like, like a, a man in his own world, for sure, if there, if there ever was um, one. Okay. I just want to clean my desk up here a little bit. Okay. That feels good. So, let's go to our next step. Okay, so while the imprimatur dries on the canvas here, let's talk a little bit about who William Blake was and what makes him such a significant uh, figure in British art history. You know, again, possibly being the most important influential British artist of all time. 
Um, and then, you know, uh, obviously super popular elsewhere around the world. Um, so where should we go? Let's go here. So um, William Blake, born in 1757 and dies in 1829 at age 69. You know, at really still relatively young age um, and, uh, you know, really kind of just really getting started. I, I mean, I mean, he'd been working for, you know, 50 years prior to this, but really, I think, picking up steam as he goes. The, the image we're working on today, Jerusalem, is really his, from his final masterpiece. He considered it to be his masterpiece and, uh, you know, published just a few years before he died. Uh, but it, who knows what he would have done had he lived for another five years, a decade or so. Uh, so, you know, William Blake, I mean, I, here's a whole bunch of quotes, you know, talking about how he was he was placed number 38 in the BBC's poll of 100 Greatest Britons. Um, 21st century critic Jonathan Jones says that he's far and away the greatest artist Britain has ever produced. I mean... And there are some great artists that have come out of Britain. Uh, so that's quite the compliment here. Um, so um, maybe I'm gonna f I'll focus just mostly on his, his early, the first half of his life, let's say, perhaps. And then maybe on Sunday, I'll look at the second half of his life, like really the, 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 his career. So that way... I have something to talk about on Sunday. Um, so, uh, so Blake is is born into a maybe middle class, upper middle class family in London. His father was a um, uh, in the textile business was, as they say, a hosier, which is someone who who made pantyhose, basically, right, like women's stockings. Um, now. It's interesting, yeah, so there's, he's born into a family, I think he's the the third of seven children, so two of those children also died uh, quite young, so there's, you know, which is not unusual for this period of time, um, but, you know, you it would still have been kind of a traumatic thing for the family to have lost, you know, uh, young children, um, speaking as a father myself, that I just can't even imagine, how one would overcome such a thing. Um, originally, the father's side of the family comes from Ireland, moves to London, um, and his father was actually quite encouraging of, of uh, the young William's interest in art and buys him various different prints to study from. And one of the reasons we think that he, you know, was of a of a family that had some means is that many of the prints that his father was buying for the the young William Blake were um, were on the more expensive end of what would have been available at the time. So as opposed to just sort of cheap throwaway things that you know might have been printed in newspapers or you know that people famously wrapped fish around um, and fish and chips kind of thing. So there is kind of the suggestion that wow, it must if these are you know and they 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 that came those some of those prints have been preserved um, by various museums in England as as after he died. So th there that kind of raised some eyebrows because on the other side of things, William Blake only you know was in school until I think age ten, and then is um, uh, educated at home by his mother. So which is Again, there's a lot of speculation, as, and there's lots of different people who have written different biographies and, and all sorts of different kinds of, um, you know, reading into different things. Like, was he educated at home because the family, you know, was um, needed money, so they put the young boy to work? Or was there other reasons why he was taken out of school? Um, you know, we're not, not really sure, but... Uh, um, one of the so anyway he's he's stays at home and he's doing like from the age of, of 10 he's working at home and he's starting to learn how to do some printmaking um, and he's studying he's basically tracing and copying images by 
uh, these by great Greek artists of you know 2,000 years before, uh, as well as the artists of the Renaissance. And remember, Renaissance is the rebirth, right? The 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 this turning back towards the great art of antiquity after the so-called Middle Ages, medieval period of time, right? So you have you know artists like Michelangelo and Raphael, Leonardo are artists that looked back at Greek art at, for inspiration, skipping over, you know, this, the, the a lot of things that had happened um, in between, which is why, you know, unfairly, perhaps the Middle Ages were, were called such a thing as that they're, you know, the same sort of thing is in the, that people would say like the flyover states between New York and Los Angeles and, and stuff, right? It's a kind of a derogatory term. It's like, yeah, there's really nothing there. We just fly over it. And the same thing that the Middle Ages were just this period of, you know, backwards, uh, you know, the, the world went in, into darkness and nothing of interest happened, right? So anyway, uh, um, young William Blake is is studying those types of images, and you really see it in his work. As we'll take a look here, like this, I, I would even go so far as to say a little bit of a clumsy approach to drawing uh, the 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 classical approach to drawing figures um, that. Nevertheless, William Blake totally embraced and made it his own, and it becomes his style. But William Blake, even though he had you know a classical art education, there's something about his approach to drawing as well as poetry and prose that maybe makes him more aligned with so-called outsider art, because he certainly was not a part of the the um the 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 he wasn't following the trends of the time he was off plowing his own path in a completely different direction than literally everybody at his time so um let me see here so we're he's he's taking art classes um Yeah, so even while he's he's studying art, he's also getting into poetry, making lots of, of writing poems. Um, and then he starts uh, apprenticing in 1772. So how old would he have been? 1772. So he's like, what, 15 years old when he's working with the engraver James Bezier. Um, James Bezier was was a noted engraver back in the time, and, and, you, and just... Engraving, you know, and and print making today are they're not lost arts because you know I teach at a university where we have a whole printmaking department, but there was a time like during the time of William Blake where that was the primary way images are disseminated. You would have someone make a painting, and maybe very few people actually see the painting in person. The vast majority of people would see prints that are made by other artists, sometimes by the same artist, um, and then sometimes artists would collaborate with a printer, uh, an engraver, and they would work side by side. Um, who, we were just talking about an artist a few weeks ago that, that uh, was doing that. Of course, it's going to escape me. Um, but uh, so there, that was a huge industry, and really that industry continued all the way up until the early 1920s. Remember, many of the artists of the Group of Seven that we talked about worked at a firm called Grip Limited, which was a um, in, based in Toronto, where that was their job, was to do engravings for, for newspapers, magazines, you know, posters, pamphlets, all those kinds of things. It's really not until, you know, just over the past maybe... 80 years or so, um, where most of it is now moved. There different printing techniques were in, in, invented, and as obviously the digital printing press totally, you know, made 
the the job of of a printmaker you know like a elevator boy or lamp lighter you know the kind of uh, relegated them to relative obscurity right which again would just saying things like that would upset a number of my colleagues at the university uh, but uh, and I love printing myself but it's you know it's 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 a bit of a lost art and which is a bit of a shame because uh, there's a particular kind of technique. So, long story short, he he apprentices with this other artist for um, for s like five years or seven years, and he's given the sum of fifty two pounds for a term of seven years. Now, I don't know if that is over the entire seven years. He's paid fifty two pounds. It's possible that you know back seventeen seventy two fifty two pounds. You know that's who knows. How, I mean, how much that would be worth today. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the average annual income for someone in pounds at that time would have been. Um, but, uh, so anyway, he, he's, he works as, as many artists did in the past, really before art school was really totally formalized. You would work with someone in, as an apprentice, helping them doing, you know, the same, you're running and getting coffee cleaning, sweeping, setting things up, running mail, going to the bank, doing a lot of things, and then they give you more and more responsibility to then do some of your, your practicing etching, and learning some of the techniques, doing the printing, and then slowly they give you, you're actually doing some of the etching yourself and you're learning that technique. One of the things that uh, this fellow, uh, James Bazier, teaches him is a particular a, a type of printmaking, a printmaking technique, which even at the time was kind of time consuming and not the particularly popular. And uh, there's su the suggestion that that was kind of an unfortunate thing because William Blake ends up becoming kind of a master of a technique that is time consuming and not popular and not often used. So he has this sort of education that is ultimately becomes not useless because obviously we still know him today and, and be, through his prints but did not serve him well and and probably did like set him back and and probably prevented him from gaining wide scale larger more becoming more popular during his own lifetime let's say um so there's a suggestion too that uh, during the time where he's employed by Bazil, Bazir, he's um, he's sort of sent away to to uh, do some illustrations at Westminster Abbey, and while he's there, he's um, because there might have been some dispute with another apprentice in the same studio, uh, and while he's there, he's sort of being harassed and bullied by some of the kids in the, the adjacent school. He's, he's pushed off of a, a scaffold and hits his head. And there's some people who suggest that possibly that's where it all began. The, the, the nuttiness of Blake begins when he falls off this scaffold and is injured um, because sort of going forward, he starts to say that he's, he's has these visions while he's in the Westminster Abbey, he's, you know, seeing Christ himself and the apostles, and he can hear them talking. So this sort of begins the 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 visionary life of William Blake, where he is he he sort of starts to think of himself as like a conduit for um for not only like Christ and God, but all these other, you know, uh, historical figures, you know, in this, I don't know how you would, who, I mean, you know, probably if, if William Blake was alive today, he'd probably be one of those persons, I don't know if he wouldn't be a televangelist or something, but he might be one of those persons going around talk, you know, on the Discovery Channel with, you know, looking for ghosts and, um, 
uh, and claiming that he can see them. He might have been, you know, like a, he might have opened his own psychic network on television or something. Uh, because that's sort of like what he starts claiming is happening. Again, whether this is because when he, he was injured from this fall in, in the uh, Westminster Abbey or not, or, you know, who knows, right? But But that's part of his story going forward here. Uh, so then in 1779, and so this is what, age 22, he becomes a student at the Royal Academy, um, and uh, which is also where, you know, when I was, a st I was a student at the Royal College in London, and I, when I was there, I was staying with the head of the Royal Academy, which is, a, and I, I got a chance to to spend lots of time walking around through the halls of that great old building in the center of London, England, and, you know, the Royal Academy, I could do a whole episode just talking about the Royal Academy and the, and the, the incredible things that I saw there, and I imagine William Blake would have been one of the persons that would have been really just like a kid in a chocolate factory kind of thing in that situation, because I remember walking around the Royal Academy, and they have all of these plaster casts of things like Michelangelo's David, like literally from the original sculpture, that was something that was done back in the day. They would go to famous sculptures, not just from the Renaissance, but going all the way back to like uh, famous Greek and Roman sculptures that are now in the Louvre, etc. They would cast them in plaster and make maybe five to a dozen copies of them, and they, those would go out to the various different academies in Berlin, uh, St. Petersburg, uh, you know, London, Paris, and so on, Madrid, etc. So many of those today are they're still in the Royal Academy in hallways and in dusty rooms covered in, in sheets, because most of today's artists have zero interest in, in looking at them, studying from them. I'm sure they're worth, like, they're priceless artifacts, as far as I'm concerned. They should be in museums. Um, but uh, I imagine William Blake seeing those kinds of things, seeing these plaster casts of these um, important Greek sculptures that, you know, some of the great artists of the past had also studied from, the things that inspired Michelangelo and Leonardo, that would it would have just blown his mind. I mean, someone who's who you know just you know a decade earlier is drawing them compulsively, you know just and he's copying these images. Now he's seeing this the original sculptures there in person, um, and yeah. So and at this at the same time the president of the royal academy is sir joshua reynolds and sir joshua reynolds maybe just um is you know again another one you know if if you may if you want to sort of think of like well who is another you know extremely important british artist there i'm sure a number of other people would say it's joshua reynolds um potentially like the towering giant but Reynolds and Blake couldn't have been more different. In fact, Blake himself detested Reynolds and, and thought he was a hypocrite and um, was, you know, unfit to be the president of the of the academy for all sorts of reasons. Um, in fact, he even had like a, a list of um, what did he? There was a, what did he, let me see if we have. Um, so, so here we have like uh, William Blake made a list of his adversaries that he he had like in his studio, and um, William and his original teacher here, James Bazil, was all James Bazil. Why am I keep James Bazir uh, was uh, was on that list, although crossed off at some point. You know, it's kind of one of those like, oh, what what's this list of your enemies <laughs> that you're compiling? But um, Joshua Reynolds also made it on that list. Because Blake, you know, you know to, as we look back in time, William Blake is considered to be one of the great romantic artists or even pre-romantic, proto-romantic artists. And romanticism is, 
is an art movement that kind of follows after the Renaissance. I mean, it's like 200 years after the Renaissance. Um, that is really privileging the emotions and the 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 internal world of the artists themselves. That is, um, that uh, it, it's about artists expressing their own unique view of the world, right? So, and this is really where we start getting into, um, you know, artists as as important, you know, like superstars, like rock stars on their own. Now we've, you know, there were famous artists in the Renaissance, but they're really trying to, they're kind of, kind of following that, that ancient tradition of, um, of reproducing the classics as closely as possible. And one's own unique vision wasn't so important. Right, um, you, I mean, Michelangelo, Leonardo, Exic did versions of 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 work in the past really, really well, and that's why they're so well known today. But they, I don't think the 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 approach was necessarily th their own desire to communicate their own feelings and thoughts. It's mostly just doing what everyone else is doing really, really well, like a craftsperson, for instance. Romanticism shares some of that, uh, but it's also kind of a reaction against that, where it's all about like, like privileging the artist's own viewpoint on things and trying to express what's going on inside and the thoughts and feelings that one might have, in especially feelings, because those are things that that you know the in the past. Um, were sort of seen as 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 unreliable or or not even unreliable as as uh, potentially the downfall of a person. So romanticism is rather than ignoring the emotional world within, um, elevating that and exploring it and um, and. Uh, mining it for for useful purposes, as you know, and William Blake is is like the the most perfect example of that because he, amongst any of the other Romantic artists of the time, uh, just went full full speed down his own path with 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 complete abandon. Um, and it is kind of, so it is, there's a bit of a kind of a strange potential contradiction between someone who's really interested in the art of antiquity and of the Renaissance, and yet also interested in Romanticism and his own internal world and expressing his feelings and emotions. Um, so there, there is this, one almost senses within Blake a... Uh, a, a person sort of wrestling with um, con contrary, being pulled in, in different directions, I suppose. Um, and one almost senses in a lot of his work and his, his poetry, his prose, like a certain, like a, 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 um, a very conflicted person who's kind of, who's, who's, tortured between um, expressing himself and uh, and expressing these great ideals of the past um, well you know and it says here you know Eve, despite the fact that he has these disagreements with with Joshua Reynolds, he can nevertheless continues to submit work to the Academy, which again, back in the day, we've talked about this a dozen times, but back in the day, the Academy was the only way that you could exhibit your art as a, and be a, a, a legitimate professional artist. You had to have the approval of the Academy and the Academy every year would have one or two major exhibitions and everyone who was a member of the Academy was invited to submit 
you know, as, as many paintings as they wanted. And then these, the, the senior members of the academy, like Joshua Reynolds and a bunch of old white guys and beards, would sit around and pick the art that they deemed not only best, but also exemplified the ideals of the academy. Right, so if you were kind of running afoul or doing anything different than that, then if, then you're just not going to get your work exhibited. If your work's not exhibited as part of the salon, then how is anyone going to see your work? How's anybody going to know what you're doing at all? There really weren't avenues for artists back at that time. So you kind of had to play by the rules, uh, which I'm sure drove William Blake absolutely bonkers. The idea that he had to get approval from someone like Joshua Reynolds that he did not respect and did not like, it would just, you know, would have further angered him and frustrated him. Uh, and uh, we'll see this again going forward. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting that at this same sort of period of time, there's a kind of a, a riot that breaks out. There's this kind of... Um, uh, a big mob that that storms a prison and and William Blake is just sort of walking down the street back to his studio or his mentor studio when he gets sort of swept up into this mob that, that goes and attacks the prison and frees all the prisoners and he you know according to legend I guess is literally finds himself on the front lines of this mob tearing down the gates and so it's you can just you just I mean that that says it right there. This is a guy that is like, you know, just cannot stand authority and wants to tear down the prison gates and free whoever's inside there, regardless of why they they happen to be there. William Blake wants it wants to burn it down. Right. So which is one of the reasons William Blake is sort of seen as like the like the prototypical iconoclast anarchist revolutionary he's he's beloved by anyone that is fighting against you know a tyrannical you know uh, authority bureaucracy he's um he's someone that just has has no time for that and not only wants to fight against it but is just going to transcend it by doing his own thing and it, so it's no surprise that later on in William Blake's life, he buys his own print, uh, printing press and he just starts printing his own work. He's having difficulty getting it into out in front into the world. So he's like, how do I how do you get art into the hands of people that can't afford to go to the salon at the Royal Academy once or twice a year like during maybe the, the spring and fall uh, salons? All right, well, are you going to make a painting and just hang it on the sidewalk? Or, like, how is that going to work? Well, one way is you could make prints. And you can sell prints for much less money than than a painting. And you can make thousands, infinite amounts of prints. And you can give them away. Or you can make books and sell them in bookstores. Or, you know, so I think as we'll see William Blake's really sees printmaking as an avenue for him to uh, just totally circumvent the salon altogether, do his own thing, whatever he's interested in, and not have to wait for their approval to move forward. Now, maybe I think I'll, I'll continue talking about the rest of his biography on Sunday. And uh, let's just take a quick look at the art of William Blake here. get all this queued up um, but um, you know so here what, what's what what's, I think it's 1757 so that's 60 oops so you know for the that initial first 20, 25 years of his life, he's an apprentice working for Bazir and then a student under Joshua Reynolds. So it's not really until his mid to late 20s where he kind of comes into his own as an artist. Um, so we see some of these 
there's not a lot of his early work that has um, been preserved. Um, it's it's also it wouldn't surprise me, and and maybe there maybe this is something in the record that he he might have destroyed some of that work and uh, not wanted it exhibited or seen again. But um, you know by this time where he's really starting to come in his own, he's like forty years old, right? So or late thirties kinds of things, um, and I think. One of the things that William Blake is famous for is is the the stories that he tells, the poems that he creates, are are about um, feature his his own cast of thousands, literally thousands of characters, which is very uh, like Tolkien esque, like J.R.R. Tolkien, who wrote The Lord of the Rings and envisioned this entire sprawling, um, uh, not universe, but uh, world of landscape of, of people and elves and, uh, you know, uh, dwarves and all these different kinds of characters, wizards. It's William Blake probably established for Tolkien himself that same sort of um, uh, personal mythology that, that that was something that that someone like Tolkien himself could create because William Blake had done it himself. William Blake creates uh, he's he he was raised in a very religious family. Um, and the, the Bible was like the central document that the, the, the father would read to the son every night. So William Blake is living in the stories of the Bible, right? That's his imagination is infused with Old Testament figures. And um, so later on, when William Blake is getting older, he's creating... Um, He's, he's sort of telling biblical stories, as, as we see, obviously, Christ being uh, crucified here, and then the next painting on Sunday is the resurrection. But he's also um, mixing them in with his own set of characters um, and sort of transposing people like Jesus from, you know, the from history and the Bible into a sort of a parallel universe where, um, so it's, I, and I, honestly, to I, there, it is such a complex world that even though I've I've spent years reading and and I'm I've, I'm, a sh I'm a huge fan, particularly of the art of William Blake, the the poetry and prose of Blake. Um, while, you know, some of it is very accessible, like the, 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 it's not the most difficult stuff to read, but trying to make sense of how it all fits together, my mind is, is, is not capable of comprehending it. And putting together today's episode, like, let's say if, if we look at, um, uh, there might be. And actually, well, yeah, let's see the perf like, um, so they, they I mean, they call the, 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 uh, much of the oeuvre, as one might say, of William Blake as being kind of one giant personal mythology. And they, they sort of refer to this as these prophetic books, uh, that, you know, involve, um, you know, that are largely inspired by the biblical Bible, uh, but also include, you know, contemporary politics and um, news. And there, it's just, it's so, um, so complex that, that that was one of the reasons, again, that William Blake was ridiculed and dismissed during his own lifetime, is that even people that, that, um, were his, were on his, uh, uh, you know, colleagues and friends that, that appreciated his art and even his poems also found like, 
you're like, whoa, you are whew, off in your own world. Like, because many people back in the day and to this day literally have no clue what, you know, how this whole big puzzle kind of fit together. And, and you know, he's not unusual for, for creating his own world. I mean, another one of my favorite authors, Jack Kerouac, had a whole, basically saw all of his books kind of fitting together and telling one large epic story. Um, you know, uh, you know, you'd say George Lucas and Star Wars. You know, there's lots of, you know, the whole Marvel Universe you know, mostly created th through the imagination of Stan Lee and a number of incredible artists that he collaborated with. Um, but William Blake, I think partly because he was so... He, he had suffered so many setbacks throughout his career, um, had didn't really have an editor, I guess, to, to put it uh, one way, in that he just just kept on going and could have cared less how people made sense of it or if they could make sense of it at all. Um, so there's a number of, I mean, there's a whole bunch of these artworks, right? Like this painting of Isaac Newton, right? So you, you have historical figures like Newton making their way into uh, the mythology of William Blake. You've got... Um, Greek gods making their way alongside Christian gods. Um, uh, I mean, it's it is quite the um, I, don't know. I mean, some of these some of these ones are they're really dark and strange and weird. Like there's you know he's he's interested in um, in God and. And heaven, but also, you know, very interested in describing what the, uh, what hell would look like, and Satan and all of his minions and things. You know, you, you think of like another one of uh, the, the the stories that Blake illustrated is as uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, which you know it, it features kind of the the fall of of uh, Satan into hell um, I mean how, I don't, how can I show there's his uh, plaster cast of his face I mean the the work of William Blake. Th this not only so again he was really interested in these in this particular kind of classical way of drawing. You know some of these illustrations you could see would have been not are very similar to some of the things that that were uncovered on the walls of homes in Pompeii that was buried by uh, Mount the eruption of Mount Vesuvius. Right, uh, you know they they look. Like they could be right, they're 2,000 years old. That the same particular kind of Romanesque nose and features that Picasso himself would come back to circle, circle back to later on. Um, but there's, but the way that they're they're done, and even the color, the particular way that he's coloring these in, they have this sort of faded. Um, I mean, they're done. They're prints that have been hand painted hand tinted with watercolor but the the because the saturation is they're kind of muted and um you know they look like they look like uh you know movies when they've been you know black and white movies that were then hand colored uh, you know or they have you know they, they couldn't put fully saturated colors down because then that would cover up the black lines right and then they would just get totally obliterated so they had to be kind of thin uh, coats of of paint or watercolor or ink and yet so they 
they always have this this look that that I I don't know the first thing that comes to mind is I think about like dreams like that are slightly faded and foggy and indistinct and not fully saturated in the way that maybe quote unquote reality is excuse me I'm going to sneeze here one second <clears throat> and I just think it's um, it lends it lends itself very well to Blake's uh, to the to the the content of Blake's work that they are they're almost like from uh, the dream world or a parallel world where you know like uh, like that they like something like this looks like it could have been you know pulled from the ashes of Pompeii you know after a thousand years covered in in mud and, and ash and that it's kind of yellowed in the same way that like a painting might yellow after because of the varnish has has um, um, has aged right and that when they clean a painting all of a sudden some of the colors that were there kind of come back in in, in, in strength these these paintings by Blake probably look similar to the way they looked when they were painted. Maybe they have yellowed a little bit, but they have that kind of patina that one expects with with older work, right? Um, I love so this is a painting. I might even want to I might do this for uh, Halloween. I just love this, the ghost of a flea. It's it's such a weird, creepy. Str and this is not the, even the best image. But there's a number of these William Blake things that that you could almost imagine being right out of the work of Hieronymus Bosch, the, the great Renaissance painter that's like a super proto-surrealist artist with all these kind of monstrous little figures. And Blake himself just loved that type of thing. And, you know, there and there was a bit of a market for that, you know, there, that would titillate... Um, collectors you know these kind of strange things that might have even been potentially um you know uh, what would they what would you call that um heretical or whatever you know that that maybe a, a small painting like this of which this one is very small um might be something a collector might have in hidden away in a book or on a shelf um and only brought out when you know certain close friends come over to have cigars and and uh, um, and whiskey or something right you, you bring out the, the good whiskey and you bring out a couple of these kind of uh, um, heretical bizarre artworks by by Blake anyway I think I want to get move on here to to, to actually painting. But because I we could you know I again I, I still haven't even got into like the career of William Blake, um, which I think we'll talk about on Sunday. So let's let's start uh, painting away here. So the next step I think we want to do is do a little bit of underpainting because um, that, I think that might help going forward. Although it took, hmm now I think about it, if we do. If I'm going to paint this in relatively thin coats of paint and paint it kind of like a watercolor, I could see people doing today's painting as a watercolor, no problem. If I'm going to paint it like that, then I maybe, maybe I don't need to do, I can try to preserve these lines. Um, yeah, I think I'll do that. So it's just, just uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this. Um, if you are someone that tends to apply paint kind of th quite thickly, uh, you may want to do a little bit of underpainting, meaning trace out some of these lines so that they remain visible when, even after you put paint over top of it. Now I think you'll by looking at these two artwork side by side as I've got them here you can already see that we can use this yellow here 
in the painting on the left, and it's it's almost sort of looks like he applied this sort of yellow all over the paper. Now he probably didn't. It's it's been kind of more selectively applied, but I think it's perfect for our purpose here. Okay, so let's see. What should our first step be then? So maybe let's let's go to. Okay, so I'm going to skip over the um, underpainting and do, go directly to painting the background. And if we look at the background, uh, we've got this kind of sky. This is an oak tree and all the leaves. You'll notice that I didn't trace those out in, into my outline um, it, because there was just so much going on back there. But um, maybe we'll do a little bit of that. Where should we start here? Hmm. I wonder, now that I'm looking at this, I, maybe I do want to draw... Don't want to do those... Leave. You know what, no, I, let's, okay, let's, let's try to simplify this. It is Easter, and not everyone's got an infinite amount of time to, to work on this, Michael, so let's... Uh, okay. So what I'm going to use here is my satin glazing liquid or matte glazing liquid. There is I do have gloss, um, but satin is is your non-glossy fluid, right? Just trying to think how much blue I want to put in here. Now I, I think you know if I just take this and start painting directly with this, it's going to turn out to be kind of green. In fact, let's eh, not too bad, but. I'm going to put just a little bit of white in here. And that white is going to cover up some of that yellow. So that instead of getting such a green color, we'll have a little bit more of a blue color. You see the difference there? As soon as I started doing this, I realized maybe I should have... Not painted the whole thing in and just gone for the... Tried to already start painting the rays.
that does look a little bit lighter on this let's just wipe some of this off So it looks a little green on camera, but it is it is a little bit green, but it's not quite maybe as green as it appears on camera, so that's okay. Um, maybe I will erase some of this. So I just dipped my finger, this rag, into the water a little bit. You know, you can see it's pulling some of the yellow imprimatur off as well. I actually don't mind that so much. Okay, you know what, I'm going to blow dry this, and then I think I might actually take that blue and go back over top of this. Yeah, I think I'm going to do a little bit more of this. I'm going to take a little bit more white. <laughs> okay, now let's go for a cool brown. So let's take our cold blue, warm, or cold blue, cold, uh, cold blue, cold red, and cold yellow to make a brown. Take my medium.
So let's do the same sort of thing. Kind of like doing this kind of a bit of a painting then wiping it away. Now I'm probably going to apply a little bit of yellow back over top of some of these in some of these areas anyway, but Okay, let's blow dry that. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to also put some of the same blue that I just applied earlier. I think I'm going to put that, maybe without any white, into the same color, into the brown. So I'm going to take my... Right, this is just going to make my brown more complex and darker.
You know, as I'm doing this, I, I start thinking to myself, hmm, maybe I should use part of this technique while I'm working on my comic book, my graphic novel. Because as I'm doing it, like I'm, I think to myself, well, the one of the reasons why he would have used this type of approach is that you know he's he's printing his own images, his own books, and then he's hand painting them, and that takes it takes time to do. Right? He would work on these, you know, basically the whole his whole approach. He thought he was going to make these these books as a way of disseminating his work you know and making it more cheap and easy like to circumvent the academy and it ends up kind of totally backfiring he he, he produces very little um very few of these books i think with with the original run uh for jerusalem of which this is an illustration for i think there was only six books that he managed to get printed because the, the method that he was using that his mentor had taught him was so time-consuming um, that he really didn't get much done. There was just, it didn't work out the way he wanted. There was just very few books that got out into the world. So it is kind of a remarkable that, that we know who, who he is at all, that he wasn't just completely forgotten. I mean, I think that's... That would, to me, as I think about it, it's like, what's the story there? How do we even know who William Blake is to this day? He must have had some um, big champions of his work either during or after he died, during his life or after he died. Because I'm sure, you know, there's, because it's, yeah, it's, uh, that's something for me to think about as I go forward. Okay. That's pretty good. I think I want to do one more pass here. This time using mostly some... We'll do, make a little bit of an orange color here. Oh, you know, I should blow dry all of that, what I just did. So the reason why I'm blow drying is that what happens is, is if I paint wet paint onto wet paint in this particular approach and I start trying to wipe it off, that's that's how this, you know, I start scrubbing back down to the, to the original white of the canvas, right? Which you may or may not like, but, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of it myself, so... So this kind of orangey layer, that's very thin. Barely visible.
going to take some cool yellow right out of the tube. I'm going to paint that back into these radiating areas where, where the light is radiating out because it just to cover up the white of the canvas that I wiped away there. Another thing too, this may be a little bit different than what we've done in the past is often what we want to do is arguably to, to get rid of any of these pencil lines or graphite charcoal lines from the image transfer process and kind of, and so that it just, we just see paint on the final layer. And that is, that, you know, that's totally fine. It makes sense. The, the difference here though, is that you know, this is originally a print, and so those lines are important, at least for um, William Blake to see where the color needs to go. So, um, keeping them there, in this instance, is not such a bad thing after all. So what I'm, I've just done is took a little bit of white and mixed it in with my cool yellow. Just so I can get some of these radiating lines back that I accidentally painted over a little bit too thick. Now, if I knew what I was doing when I began the painting, I would have just left these areas maybe a little bit more untouched, but I didn't know what I was doing until I started doing it. Which is not typical, which is very typical, for, sorry, for how these episodes unfold, as you probably might notice, is kind of like thinking on my feet here and solving the problem as I paint it. This is one of the great things with acrylic paint is if you make a so-called mistake, we'll just let it dry and put a little bit of white in there and paint it out. No one will know the difference. One of the things I was thinking about as I was starting, I'm like, you know what, I could be done, maybe I'll be done in 20 minutes here, I'm doing, this is going really well. And then I was thinking, you know what, the second I say that aloud, I just guarantee myself I'll be here till like midnight working on this thing.
so I'll just show you what I'm going back and putting this white in because I realize it'll just make, make my life a lot easier if I do this now. And Paula says, midnight? Oh, I'll have to move my bed to the kitchen. <laughs> um, now I'm just going to take my cool yellow on its own. And just paint back over top of all that white, the yellow white. So again, if I was to start this painting again, I would try to be a little bit more mindful of of where these radiating beams are, and I would just paint around them, but I didn't do that when I started, so this is how I'm cleaning up that mistake, which is totally fine, right? We make mistakes all the time. And I don't really know if I could consider this a mistake, just something I'm just learning as I approach the painting. I mean, he, he most certainly didn't do this. He probably did not paint with white ink or, um, or paint. He would have just uh, painted around those areas. A little bit more yellow here.
Oh, I forgot to talk about that. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Or on Sunday. Okay, let's blow dry this and we'll move on. Okay, let's go to the next step. So we've got our background, I think, pretty well established. I want, I'm going to go back and do more to it. I'm, I need to get much darker. But before I, I do that, I want to get the figures established um, so that I can more accurately judge just how dark the background is needs to go. I don't want to go too far until I know how far I need to go, right? Uh, because then I'll end up having to do what I just did, is paint some stuff out to get it back to this space. Okay, so let's look at the figure of Jesus. Oh, and if, I didn't even really talk about... Uh, I mean, the... the, the Let's, I didn't even really talk about what the story is here in this painting. Um, so, the, the story behind this painting, uh, you know, the, so, okay, so this is plate 76 of I don't know how many illustrations there are I don't know if it's oh there's 100 etched plates so uh, and some of those in fact So, like, this poem, Jerusalem, like, this is, the, I think, the title, the cover page here. Actually, does it... Maybe this is easier just to look at it. Like, here. Um, has some pages like this, which have f are full-page illustrations, including, to obviously, today's. But a lot of the book is made up of... Um, okay, I guess we don't have that... of pages sort of like this, Oops. where we see, you know, a lot of writing. And of course that's also printed. So he's he's etched that out um, and then made prints. So each page is a different print, right? And some of these pages have almost no imagery at all. 
right? So we, we see things like this. This is where this very famous line, and did those feet in ancient time comes from, um, is like right from the preface at the beginning of the, of the book here. I mean, you can see he's he's weaving in things like Homer and Ovid, Plato, right? The Bible. I mean, the Greek stories. The you know, it's just it is a a lot of stuff going on. It reminds me, and in, in, in the best way, of a lot of my university students come to school with like a fully developed universe of characters that they've been coming up with graphic novels and video game ideas because that's what they spend most of their time doing. A lot of young people who want to become artists are kind of a little bit solitary and um, have uh, um, a lot of time to kind of come up with their own um, uh, their own worlds and often involve actual characters from other books and comics and video games that kind of weave them their way into their own stories and I think that's a lot of like what William Blake is doing but anyway uh, this story basically what we have here is this character of Albion Albion, Albion who is um, kind of like the the personification of quote unquote man, uh, like maybe Adam kind of thing, the personification of man of Britain of of the Western world itself, right? So it's this person that that at times is just a person and then at other times in the story is symbolizes the like the all the all of humanity kind of thing or of England and it's sort of the the story of his kind of fight against this um, totally rational world uh, that has you know, arbitrary laws that uh, crush the independent spirit of the people. Um, and so, in the in the painting here, we have Albion stumbling upon the the crucified um, Jesus on this oak tree, and is sort of like kind of prostrating himself in front of Jesus and saying like like he recognizes the power of Christ and also just like oh my goodness what have we done ah like we've Jesus here is not just like God's uh, or God or God's son that humanity has made the the grave mistake of crucifying but also it's like the um, nailing this 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 person who's who's sort of also the embodiment of love and passion and emotion and nailing them to the tree of knowledge and it's sort of like the um, the to in in, in I'm, I'm talking about here in Blake's own world in mythology like this idea of this this the Christ um, you know the, the the great disservice that humanity is has done to uh, this the 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 symbol of love in the in in the name like killing him in the name of of cold rationality right and and hanging him on the tree of knowledge right so the um, and we have Albion is the symbol of man standing in front of him like you know trying like recognizing the sublime beauty of Christ and and also recognizing that the how horrible and horrific it is the of, of what has happened to this person and, and, and because especially of what he stands for or God or etc right um, so yes this is here we have Albion 
and Christ. Right? Maybe I should have mentioned that earlier in the in the video. Uh, so where was I? We were about to paint the foreground. Okay, let me just let's go back to this. Okay. <laughs> okay. So now we've we've. Um, Okay, so now we've established our background. Let's go into the foreground and start painting Christ and Albion uh, and start putting some colors in, in there. And then we'll go back into the background and darken that in our next step here. So uh, let's now move into our warmer colors. Okay, so here's some, again, satin glazing fluid, or matte glazing fluid, depending on the brand, right? You could use gloss glazing fluid. I, I have a whole jug of it, uh, but um, I tend to find I like matte better because I don't like the glossy look of acrylic paint. I always find that makes it look very plasticky, but to each his own, right? If, if that's something you like, then use it. And there's, there's That's just my own weird biases I guess maybe it's because I originally began um, as an oil painter an oil paint generally has a more matte quality to it I mean obviously if you put a lot of of uh, like linseed oil into your paint it's gonna get shinier but I tend to kind of paint relatively thin layers of paint so Oh wow, I, now that I'm just looking at this, I didn't even notice this before, but look how he's painted it. That is wild. I didn't even notice these little... Oh, okay. Hmm. Hmm. That's, that's different than I was, what I was just about to do. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. I was just going to paint kind of areas of red, orangey red. So instead, let's, we're going to go do something very different. I'm going to get very fine detail then, I guess. So I'm going to use a much smaller, pointier brush to do this. Uh, Hmm. So that what we're looking at here is definitely a printing, like this is like a almost like a woodblock print. But I mean, he's he's carving away lines, uh, which represent the white, and then the, where the raised edges are getting the printing ink, and that's where we get this orange. This, uh, okay, is going to take me longer than I was expecting at this stage, but, you know, probably it's, it's also going to simplify things eventually as well, right? Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to need... So this, my mixture here had a lot of glazing fluid mixed in, and it's... For what I was about to do, that would have been perfect, but to do what he did, I'm going to instead mix more of a fully saturated color. I'm still going to have 
some of that glazing fluid in there, but it won't be quite as transparent as I was just about to paint. So as I just noticed, it's like it barely shows up on here. I'm also I'm having an internal debate as I'm working on this, as thinking about using a Posca pen to finish this painting off. Or do I want to paint the whole thing? The one reason why a Posca pen may not be the best is that it's so bold, those the, the lines that it creates, that um, it'll look more comic book-like than, than this. So I think only time will tell whether this was a good strategy here to try to mimic
this approach. Totally different than what I was planning on doing. You could also do this with a Posca pen, by the way. With like an orange Posca pen. Again, that might be really bold, so just be careful. I, I also have an orange Posca pen, but I'm a little leery about using it for this type of situation. So this layer would would have likely been a print and not hand colored. So he must have made like a separate plate of orange that is going over top of oops, um, everything else, and then a lot of the darker like but basically everything I've painted thus far is hand painted but this probably went down before the rest of the paint was uh, our ink or watercolor has been applied You know, like this is this is why I like doing these episodes is that you know I had a vision in my mind before we began of a fairly certain as to like how I would do this painting. I mean, I've been thinking about it for a while because I'm a big fan of his work, but I also know that it's you know he's got his own kind of very idiosyncratic process. And it's really not until the, you start painting where, at least for me, all of a sudden some approaches make more sense than others. And you're like, oh, okay, well the way I was going to, I could do it the way I was planning on doing it, but I'm not sure I'm going to get the results I want. Or it's going to look diff very different than the original. Is that acceptable or not? And I would say for anybody watching, it's totally acceptable to do it in whatever method you want. I'm just, as part of these episodes and for, for people watching, I want to sort of get as close to the original as, as I can. Oops. And that if other people want to follow that path, then they are welcome to. Or if other people want to use a divergent approach, then that also works.
It's also worth noting that if you are like, well, yeah, Michael, your your lines are pretty good, but you're a little sloppy, but you know, obviously the original is much bigger. Well, unfortunately it's not. The original is, was only a couple inches bigger. I think this, the, this painting is what, um, oh, it's eight, eight by 8.5 inches by 6.3, so it's even smaller. Goodness gracious. Um, I mean, I think this is going to turn out pretty cool. It's just, uh, again, different approach than I was expecting. It does, it's now looking more Blake-like than it would have had I not done this. So basically I'm just painting radiating lines everywhere in the top two thirds of this painting. This also, one thing it is doing is kind of obscuring a little bit of the pencil lines from my image transfer. I did say earlier that, you know, it, it's part of the, this process is, uh, is different than the way we've made a number of paintings because the goal is not to hide these, these lines. In fact, we want to kind of keep them there because potentially that would, you know, because I don't think Blake went and painted any of the black lines again. Those would have just been from the initial print, so he's just coloring it. Um, so 
So those lines serve a really important purpose. But I, I will say that painting kind of these orange lines over top does feel like I'm integrating those lines much better than them just being black lines there. I mean, now this really has a vitality to it that is pretty cool. These lines, all that radiant, it just really feels like this. That's energy just shooting outwards here. Right, like that, that already looks very William Blake-ish, Blake-like, right? That, that makes me feel really happy. I wasn't expecting to do that, but I'm very satisfied with the way that looks. Also gonna do, he's got a bit of this radiating outwards from here too. Okay, I think I'll blow dry this. Okay. 
So, let's look at... Huh. The other figure down here also has a similar quality, but it's, it's more red, pinkish, in fact, peachy color. So, let's take our warm red. So get, well, maybe that might have been too much white. So we could do that again. This time I am going to use some more glazing fluid here. Otherwise it might be just too dark, too strong. We'll see if I am, I might need to dip into this and get a little bit darker again, but it's always easier to have something a bit more transparent and then to go darker as needed. Oops, let's zoom in. So let's get a bit more of the red pink in here, with less uh, medium. Notice like I painted right into the hair, because this area is going to be darker anyway. So that I could test out my paint. even be just a little bit dark so I kind of want a little medium happy medium in between all of that there
And maybe now that I sort of feel more confident with what I'm doing with the body, let's maybe go back up top to the face. You know, as I'm doing this, I'm, I'm thinking a little bit about uh, Roy Lichtenstein, Lichtenstein, um, the great pop artist painter, and the and the dots, the bende dot pattern that he used so famously. You know, it's in comic books and newspapers even to this day. And when we did that painting of. Uh, was the nurse, right? Is that what was the painting we did? Uh, we did all that we hand painted all of the dots, and uh, it gave, a, I think, a really neat effect that was very similar to the pointillist techniques of the um, pointillist painters like Soro and. Um, uh, Oh, who are some of the other pointless painters? Uh, what's his name? Name just names are just escaping me right now. Um, so it's the D. Anyway. Uh, this is is not too dissimilar from doing dots. You know, instead of dots, we're just doing lines. Okay, just be careful, Michael. You're getting sloppy. Come on, let's let's just do this properly. Now what's interesting is all of this stuff down here. What is, it's almost like a sponge. And it makes me wonder if I should get a sponge out to do that. That would be tricky. Do I want to use a sponge to get that texture? I don't know if I have a sponge with that type of well let me see let's let's do it um okay What's the best way to do this? So I just got an old sponge. I just used this. Um, I haven't used this in a long time. It's probably covered in dust. Um, but let's clean this brush up. And um, let's just let's just dive right in and just see what we get. I have a feeling that's going to go on pretty thick. So again, this area is going to be very dark, so let's just...
Okay, I'm kind of getting a technique down. I think what it is, is I just need to be totally flat. Otherwise, I'm getting um, edges. So, I mean, obviously none of that got captured on camera very well. But I, I like kind of how it's turning out down here. And that's okay because that's an area where it will stay. I was able to practice this technique in areas where it's just going to go black anyway. So, let me just see. Is there anywhere else... I think that's probably good. I'm just looking at the rest of the painting. So uh, that's fun. I've never, I haven't used this. I've used a sponge probably 20 years ago in the last time I used it in the painting. So. Okay. Coming along. Let's blow dry all that. So the reason why I'm, I'm sort of, it took me longer to blow dry that than maybe it, you might expect is because there's, I put quite a lot of this glazing fluid mixed into my paint. And there's a, this does a few things. One of which is it, it makes the paint more transparent. So I get more of that watercolor look, but it also has a slow dry um, chemical in here that, that slows the drying time down. Uh, you know, acrylic paint, one of the, the, the core qualities of it is that it can dry very quickly. Like literally within five, ten seconds, it might be bone dry, depending on how thin or thick you apply the paint, right? Whereas this can make that same brush stroke that would take maybe ten seconds to dry, could, can maybe makes it takes a minute to dry, right? So... I'm blow drying it so that I can make sure that any of these little details, you know, all these fine little brush strokes I did, quote unquote, fine brush strokes, are adequately dry so that when I paint over it again, I'm not going to smudge them or it's going to mix in or that I, I, I'm quite confident that it's going to stay the way it looks as, you know, I intended it to be. So let's do another pass on these figures. Uh, maybe let's go back up to Christ up here and add some blue into the body. And then down here, we're going to add some purple into the body. So you can see that they're, they're slightly different 
character or colors here. Christ has, you know, this orange. You know, let's maybe let's zoom in to just so we can see. Christ has kind of orange and blue, right? And and maybe that. So we have that gives it this quality where he's kind of glowing um, light, this like this inner light emanating. But that blue also makes him look kind of cold and dead, right? So that he's, even though he's dead, he's there's like an inner life force coming out of him. Whereas the character on the bottom, Albion, um, again, that's a character totally from um, uh, Blake's own imagination. This this character down here, he's he's a little bit more peachy color. Right and purpley colors, which make him look warmer, more fleshy, more maybe human, right? Um, and and alive, right? And and he also doesn't have that inner glow emanating from him that the Christ does, right? He's he's just a regular guy, technically, I guess, right? Um, although you know, again, the 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 mythology of Blake confuses everything and it's like well what 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 are what's what is actually going on in this painting now i just noticed uh that i wanted to put you know this area here i want to be similar above the arms of the tree i want to come back up and put a bit of this same color that i have down here in here so that I, I, I want to make sure everything's sort of treated the same way so that we don't have the this being one kind of color and then we come up here and it's almost like the painting has been cut in half. I want them to, there to be a logical consistency here. So I'm just going to add. Now, does it mean that some of the work that I just spent all that time doing, my those radiating lines is that they start to get obscured a little bit totally right absolutely is that kind of frustrating not really i could see why some people you know just getting into painting like well why would you why would you spend all that time painting an area that you're just going to kind of that is going to get obscured later why not just skip those areas well a couple of things is i don't really know what needs to be obscured and what what not my brain's just not big enough to be able to remember all those things so it's just easier for me to paint it in in the moment and then to paint it over later um that's that's the big thing my own uh, limitations of intelligence um and then the second thing is is well you know it's not all it's not going to disappear it's still there and it's kind of nice to, to have the option to kind of keep it or bring it out and, and to be able to see some of those details through the paint. That's what that's what's so satisfying as a viewer when you see something and you maybe from afar it does looks like it's just a solid black shadowy area and then you realize, oh, look at all the detail in the shadow. Isn't that, look how he spent all that time painting into an area that most people don't see. It's Again, it's that you're rewarding a viewer for spending more time, for looking more carefully at your artwork. You know, it's that, it's like, it's like a, a quality of craftsmanship. Right where you know it's like you're, uh, you know, like how a carpenter might, you know, spend time on parts of uh, of furniture that maybe you know the underneath the chair, rather than just leaving it a bunch of loose ends and things. Like a you know, another example, you know, I'm a I'm a hockey fan. And you, sometimes you might notice I have a collection of hockey jerseys over here. The the really the the main difference between a, a so-called real jersey and a fake, of which I have a few. I've ordered 
some sometimes mistakenly off of eBay a, a fake jersey because I was like, wow, that's really cheap. I'm going to snap that up. And then it gets here. I'm like, oh, it's a knockoff. It's a fake. No wonder it was so cheap, right? Uh, but one of the, the telltale signs of the knockoff is that it looks okay from from the outside. It's not perfect. It's, it looks probably okay on camera. And then... But up close, it starts to fall apart. But the inside is where we see the majority of the difference. On the, the authentic jerseys, on the inside, it looks nice. It's It looks clean. and and you, I mean, but the, the knockoffs inside is just a mess of threads. And it just looks terrible, right? It's the kind of thing you're, you look and you're like, ooh, that's brutal. Because... You know, you're they're, you're paying a third of the price, and so they're just knocking them out as quickly as possible out of a factory. And um, you sort of, you get what you pay for, right? And I'll tell you, even though you can't see it, it's one of those things that you just like you're like, ugh, do I really want to be wearing this? It's just, what if I take it off and somebody sees the inside? They're just gonna think I'm just the you know, I've got the, the trashiest jersey. So it's, that's, um, anyway, these are the things I think about. <laughs> okay, so enough talk. More, more paint, less talk, Michael. Okay, so let's zoom in here. Okay, so let's get some more glazing fluid. Where should we? Let's do this here. And this time I'm going to take my warm blue. I'm not going to need too much of it. Again, you want to make sure that your painting is nice and, and dry for this layer, right? And you know what? I'm still going to use maybe a smallish brush for this. Now, is that too subtle? That is maybe a little bit subtle. So let's just bring a little bit more blue into our mixture here. Okay, let's try that again. Okay. That's looking better. I think I'm going to add even just a bit more blue in here. sure how much that's coming across on your screen at home. It is giving me a nice little bit of definition. Oops, that's a little bit darker than I expected. In fact, I'm going to add just a tiny bit of white in there. I want to be careful about doing adding too much white or it's going to just paint right yeah yeah you know what let's not do that uh, i'm just going to wipe clean that brush off 
You never know until you do it. I, um, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a bit more cool blue into this mixture. Because that warm blue is very dark. So... That's too dark. Let's just take. Why is that moving? That's weird. It wasn't touching it, it's just drifting on its own. Stop. What is going on? Why is that moving? So now I'm just putting a little bit more saturated blue in a few select places. Now remember, everything's going to get black shortly. It's going to get much darker. So this is just like little highlights of color that are going to imbue those shadowy areas.
Okay, now let's... Even makes me think, do I want to add a bit of this into some areas of the background, actually? Maybe not, maybe not. Let me, I, I think I'm going to keep that. Okay, yeah. So now let's go down to the, let's make a purple. See how if this is too dark or not very quickly here. So we can always test this out in your darker areas. Okay, okay. That, I thought I needed to be a little bit more on the red side. So this probably looks a little bit more crimson on camera. There is a purple quality to that, to this, that I can see.
John. What is that emoji? Is that a sad ghost, I think? I'm not sure what that emoji is. Okay. So now I'm just trying to think to myself, how do I want to tackle the rest of the dark areas of the painting? See, I'm not sure. I, I, I think this looks great in person. I'm not so sure how it looks on camera. Use this same color to paint in some texture on the tree here. Let's take this same color and get these. Actually, hold on. Let me just rethink that for a second. Let's.
I'm taking this same purple. And I'm going to put this into the edges here. That's going to make the black that sort of surrounds this entire painting really dark in those areas. All right, we've got this vignette kind of thing going on. Okay, I remember I said I'd be lucky to get under four hours on this one. That's sort of where we're at. I'm not surprised that this is taking as long as it's taking. And it's, I certainly, if I was to start this one over, I'd probably be able to get to this stage in at least half the amount of time. But it's, you know, it's a, it's, a, I'm trying to figure it out as I'm, as I'm painting it, right? So. But I love how it looks. So let's blow dry this. It's important to remember that one of the, one of uh, William Blake's, I guess, down the downfall, and which is ridiculous to say, because considering how how important and well recognized he is today, but during his lifetime, he used this printmaking process that took him way longer than expected to to print each one of these things because he's slowly painting. So if you think, oh my goodness, Michael, this is taking you forever, well. That's the I'm doing basically exactly what what William Blake himself did, and and that was um, it, the fact that it took him, you know, hours and hours and hours to hand color each page of this self-published book um, was, you know, I, I mean, I, I you know, it's hard to say. Like they turned out well enough that he's now gone down in history as one of the greatest artists of all time and one of the great British people of all time so probably you know regrets nothing you know wherever he is right now um, but it also meant that it, it sort of defeated the purpose of making prints if one of the things you generally want to do when you're making prints is, is you're doing it to save time to create more to, to create copies that you can sell at a, a relatively uh, low price in order to spread the work out as 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 far and wide as possible. The fact that he was only able to get six copies of this 100-page book, book done over the course of 15 years 
um, meant like you know that it it just uh, totally undermined the whole why most people would use. Now, I, was he really unhappy? Was he super frustrated with that? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe he didn't. Reg maybe could have cared less. But um, something to keep in mind if you're going to do the same sort of thing and you're planning on making six hundred. Because let's say so you made six copies and each copy had 100 pages and you could see it's taken me three hours to get to this stage you know that if you know it's you know you could see why it took him 15 years 14 years or so to do just six copies of this book so if you're thinking i'm going slow well basically going about as fast as william blake himself went um okay you know i do want to get a bit more pinky quality into the figure down below. Albion down here. So the thing is, is that's going to require you putting a bit of white in here. Which is not ideal because it can cover up existing paint. But it might be the only way I can get um a little bit more of that pink quality in here. So this would have been, I should have maybe have done this again before I painted all of these uh, lines on him, but. Not bad, actually that's, I don't know how well that comes across on camera, but I'm just gonna paint That's cool. It, we'll see when this how this dries. Now this is something, you know. I need glazing fluid or matte medium, a clear medium. To, I mean, I'm, maybe you could do this with water. Maybe the thing with water is it would see, it probably would go very grainy. Now what this has done is it's definitely dulled out a lot of the, the previous lines. So this, uh, but it does now feel way more fleshy, pink. And it does make me think, do I want to do a bit of that up there? I don't know. I think I got enough blue there. Take a bit of this blue. You know, one of those, this is also one of those reasons why it, I like doing multiple episodes on the same person because sometimes by the end of an episode, I'm like, oh, I figured out how to paint like this person. Ah, I finally figured it out. Okay, well, now we're moving on to somebody else next class. So it's, it is kind of nice to, you know, to figure something like this out. But it's also, I just think to myself, it's like, oh, well, now I've really, I feel like I understand this technique much better. Now I can use it in my own artwork somewhere else, which I think is probably the, the main reason people want to learn is, is not just to reproduce other people's work, but to be able to create their own works. Okay, I'm going to mute.
It's, it's also probably worth mentioning, too, that because there's only six original copies of, of this book, Jerusalem, um, each one is, and each one is different, so there's, I don't, I think I returned them all, but I had a whole bunch of books from the library, and it was interesting, they would juxtapose, like, the same image in, in various different copies of the book. So the one we're looking at is from the the Yale University collection, um, and there's there's some other ones here that that are darker, that are lighter. That there's, I think I don't know if there's one that there's I, I don't know if it's one of those six, but there's there are at least versions that are in black and white that don't have any color. So I don't know if those are I don't think that's probably from the original set of six. He probably printed a few afterwards. He might have, after doing that first six, is like, whoa. Okay, let's. I'm just going to print these, and <laughs> I'm not going to do color in these next ones because it's going to take me another 15 years. Uh, okay, so let's move on to another step here. Did I do a background pass number two? Okay, so the next step here is we're going to paint, we're going to go dark, we're going to go black now, finally, and that's going to transform this painting radically. So um, if you've been waiting for it to kind of get, for something to pop, well, that's what's going to happen over the next like hour here. Um, and then basically the decision is, do I want to do the, do I want to use a Posca pen? And for those of you who have never used a Posca pen, um, here we have, I think these are the same size, right? That one hasn't been used, this one's been used. Um, so a Posca pen is basically acrylic paint in pen form, right? Uni Posca pen. Maybe I'll just zoom in on that. So you could use this to draw all of these lines, um, which would give it a really sharp quality. It would look super graphic, not graphic violent, but graphic, um, like graphic design, very illustrative, very almost verging on comic book quality, depending on how you do it. Or I could use a brush to do this. And I I honestly don't know. One of the one of the things I don't like about these Posca pens is that it looks different. It's first of all it's it's black. And I'm gonna mix my own black. So and usually when I mix my own black, it's gonna not be black, it's gonna be like a dark, dark gray. Because even these cheap paints have a little bit of um, of uh, titanium white in it. That so means I can't get a perfect black. If I had a more expensive brand of paint, more um, professional quality, I'd get closer to it. So that's, so first of all, that would create a distinction. The other thing is I noticed that these are kind of, there's a reflective glossy quality to the paint that you can definitely see from the side. If you look, I don't know if I have, uh, painting I've done using a Posca pen nearby, but it does, it, it looks, it has a particular look that is not bad, it's just do, do I want it is, is the question. Oops. Before I, I uh, start, let's mix some black here. I think I'm at that stage where I'm just I'm going to be basically just using black. So let's make a big mixture of it. 
Uh, let's let's do it right here. I don't think I have white there, so that's okay. So I'm taking my cool blue and my warm red, mixing these guys together, and I get a really deep purple. Is that is that a is deep purple a band? Uh, right, deep deep purple. Right, like a eight seventies band deep. Why is it? I think it's I think that's a band deep purple, right? I don't know why it sounds familiar and maybe not quite right. Okay, let's take our... We're going to need some more cool yellow to balance out that... Well, maybe. Maybe... Maybe that's enough. Actually, that's better. I, I didn't... I thought I would need a lot more yellow. Now I don't, I'm certainly not gonna use all of this black, but if I decide to paint all of my black outlines, then I'm gonna wanna need black paint. And it's gonna, if I mix a small batch of this paint, then what's gonna happen is that paint is gonna drive quite quickly and I'm gonna start getting very frustrated with how um, that paint is behaving. And actually, even before I uh, clean my brush, let's just take a bit of white and mix this here. And what that does is it reveals how close I was to, to my gray. I think that's that's good. Um, I'm also going to be painting on a surface where there's a lot of yellow, so that yellow is going to infuse this paint even more and make it go further uh, black. But let's say if I mix this and it still looked a little bit purple, what that would tell me is I've got adequate amount of red and blue, I need more cool yellow. And if it was a little bit greenish, well, that would tell me I've got a lot of yellow and blue, I need more red. If it was a little bit orangey, well, I've got enough yellow and red, I need more blue. So it's just the opposite color on the color wheel that's missing there, right? Take, here's our glazing fluid. I'm just going to imbue my brush with that. You know, it's just a little. I didn't clean the brush super thoroughly, so there's a little bit of red and stuff in there. That's okay. Let's take. Well, that's probably too much, but mix that black in there. So, right, we can see how transparent that is. Right, if I painted on the other hand here, the difference between those two, that one's got glazing fluid that doesn't have any, right? So um, it's likely that I probably need a little bit more, but we'll start off slow here. It's always easier to add more black than it is to try to figure out how you're gonna get that lighten it back up again after you've gone too far. Even just getting the, the side of the painting in there.
Now remember, I might do several layers of this. So this is just my first bit, and it's going to get darker and darker as I go. So I'm, I'm going kind of slow. I'm, I'm taking my time building up the darker areas here. Putting the shading on the body, going over top of those purpley areas.
the same thing to Christ's body here. Okay, now let's, uh, let's not try and turn it. I'm going to go in and start darkening this area here. And so this is really just a process of just darkening and darkening and darkening until you get to the desired level of darkness. How much contrast do you want? You could see that William Blake himself really went dark. He really pushed the darkest values. And by pushing those dark values, it makes a really dramatic composition. Right? The, the more timid one is at this stage, the, the less kind of intense those contrasts are going to be. And by extension, kind of the, maybe the less dramatic the overall painting would be.
I mean, I really like how this is turning out, and and I can totally identify with anyone who's like, oh, I don't know about going too dark. What if I ruin it? What if I go too dark? Oh, it'll be a disaster. Um, I don't think it would be a disaster. I think it would be a great learning experience. First of all, I don't think you could really go too dark. Um, I think you'd you'd know pretty quickly if you went too dark. I mean, I still got lots of of room to to darken. But you know, if you did feel like you went too too far, well, you could always there's you could we could do glaze. In the opposite direction, we can lighten up with glaze. Glazing isn't just purely for darkening things. That's cool. It's, I, I'm liking how this is turning out. Ah, there's a genie says wonderful Lisa says looking good Lolly says oh no I'm so late hi everyone cool painting I love Blake I'll have to go back and watch from the start when I have more time in the daytime uh, happy Easter everyone by the way happy Easter Lolly great to see you in the chat um, so let's blow dry this and then I'm just gonna keep on going darkening and darkening and darkening and maybe less and less areas get darker right or so that that way we, we kind of keep the intensity in the center and then I can just start darkening further towards the, the edges. Okay, so I you can just apply the same paint over and over in the same places and it's just going to make things just get darker and darker and darker, right? This is the same level of black as I previously had. It's just being applied over other darker areas and other areas that have black and it just looks more black. Like I can paint that into this area here. And that'll get also a bit darker, but and so I'm just using my finger just to go over some edges and just darken 
or soft or soften the where the brush stroke edge was, right? Now, I might keep my, these radiating lines as the way I've done it. Now, he's kind of, his sort of end right around here. I kind of like the way that I've built this painting up. And I think I might just keep it like that. Rather than kind of vignetting the whole thing. And that's just something, you know, when you're working on your own painting feel free to take a detour or or not do it exactly like the original um, why not this might be a little bit dark we'll, we'll see I'm kind of, I'm liking, I'm liking it.
There's also the leaves of the oak tree. Like, this is a big tree here. I don't know if I'm going to put those in. I might just... Uh, keep them out. Maybe I'm going to just blend these ones down here a little bit out. Maybe I should have then also had radiating lines coming down here. It's weird for them just to stop here. Like, as if there's this visible boundary underneath his arm, so... I could try to bring a bit of that back. Now, so I can put these down here, and then as I keep on darkening, they'll just get super subtle.
Maybe that's enough. John says, beautiful, Michael. And Lolly says, hi, John. Hope you're well. Awesome. Uh, let's blow dry all that again. Keep on going. I kind of like how that looks. I mean, again, it's it's different than the original, obviously. Um, and not that I think Blake made a mistake or anything, and I'm trying to fix his painting. It's just you know my I giving myself permission to uh, go about it a little bit differently. You know, it's like every painting is a bit of a journey, and sometimes, you know, it, uh, opportunities present themselves, and you can decide what you want to do in that situation. Do you want to um, go through the door that opens, or continue going on the path that you began? Everybody's given different options. You 
And I'm probably going to darken this again and make this a little bit more subtle than it currently is. But, you know, we have to kind of build that up first before we kind of hide it. So, uh, actually, let's, before I, I was going to blow dry this, let's just keep on to maybe just a little bit more here in the sky. I do now wonder if I should make the sky a little bit more blue. Put some blue back into some of these uh, areas. That's cool. Okay. I think what I want to do oops, is I'm going to continue these lines, but very subtly. I think I'm just going to darken, or actually let's just take this brush 
Oh, is that a good idea? Just to make this a bit more subtle. So these radiating lines, especially down here, are they're visible, but they're also fairly subtle. I think um, what I have to do now is do some outlining. And I honestly, I'm totally torn whether to do use a Posca pen or paint it. Ostensibly using the Posca pen is faster. any particular hurry though so um, I am one thing though you know I wear contact lenses and I do find that you know after I've been painting for like four hours like this then my eyes start to get a little bit crossed and so doing detail fine details like this at this stage is like woof, asking for trouble let me think about it. Thanks, Lolly. <laughs> okay, so I think I'm gonna uh, hand paint this rather than use my Posca pen. N not, nothing wrong with anyone else doing that out there. Uh, it's just something I think I need to do for this painting. Um, let's just zoom right in. Or let's start up higher here. Okay. 
Okay. Um, again, one thing that I'll do... Let me just get a little closer to the right size there. Is um, I'm going, going to, you know, practice a little bit in an area where maybe the... It doesn't quite matter so much. So let's say in this armpit. All right, and you know what? I'm also going to take my my outline and kind of have that nearby because I've. Um, in fact, I might even go to my own outline that I created. Oops, not that. That's this. Because this is sort of my interpretation of some of these lines. And since, you know, I'm, I'm going to go back to... Here I'm saying, it. let's practice in an area, and then here I go right to the eyebrow. I'm going to go kind of back and forth. Areas where I feel like I need a little bit more assistance. Okay. So my black, you know, it's been on the table here for an hour. So I'm going to add a little bit of glazing fluid mix this in. I want this to be like mostly paint and not glazing fluid, mostly black. But the glazing fluid is going to make it a little bit more um, uh, is it viscous? No, is it viscous? It's the opposite of viscous thin, I think. Somewhere my high school chemistry teachers turning in their bed. Hopefully they're still around. Is that too dark? That might be too dark. Maybe actually going to, for a lighter. Yeah, okay, so I just dipped. Let's just wipe that off as quickly as possible without scrubbing too much. You can see I scrubbed accidentally a bit too much off there. So maybe actually having a bit more glazing fluid is not a bad thing. It's going to make my life easier, and it'll be more transparent. So, good. Because the this glazing fluid is going to make the paint just easier to paint with. It's it's this is the kind of thing people add water to their paint to do. Okay.
Hmm. Let me think about this. I am glad I'm not using a black Posca pen because if I feel like this is too black, too dark, the Posca pen would be way too dark. I mean, for, for my painting, I, again, everyone's paintings are gonna be a little bit different.
I have to admit my my eyes are almost it's almost to the point where I think maybe I should go put my con take my glasses on.
tapped into this just a bit too much. Let's just... Making progress, slow and steady, right? Hmm. I will say, you know, the more and more that I do these black outlines, I feel like it is a deviating from William Blake's original artwork. It's you know becoming much more of my own piece, which is not a bad thing. Not a bad thing at all, but you know, I think it's just something to kind of 
be mindful of, you know, I'm sure there's probably a few other people working on their painting right now, and be like, oh, it's, it's not looking like the original, where did I go wrong here? And it's okay, it's just, it's all about acceptance. One, two, three, four, five, okay. Let's make sure I don't have too many toes or something on there, right? It is kind of, it just, just reminds me, I remember when I was working on these, this drawing, uh, the outline, I found the original kind of lacking in detail, and uh, so I took a whole bunch of pictures of my own feet, I was just sitting on the couch, just took some, took some pictures of my feet, as, uh, uh, to try to kind of get the proportion, or not the proportions, the, you know, like the, the feet as accurate as possible. But what was funny is like, I think it was like the next day. Ay, 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 How did that, that's weird, it went right into the middle. I was teaching and I, I wanted to show the class something from my phone because I can connect my phone to the video projector. And lo and behold, all these pictures of my feet show up on the screen. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this guy's got some weird kink going on. It's like, it's just, I'm, it was a study for a painting. Because we all know it doesn't take much for a teacher to say or do something before a whole bunch of students get some, you know, something going on and... Ah, so anyway, let's push right on to Albion, Albion. And what is it? Uh, oh, look at all these comments. Uh, Lois <laughs> uh, says, yeah, it's a different, difficult type of outline. Like it's not entirely dark. It's orange and all different colors. Posca would be totally overwhelmed. Would totally overwhelm the whole thing. You made the right choice. Look, looks cool. Uh, do you and your family have any plans for Easter, Michael? I expect your little girl will be excited for chocolate Easter egg hunts, etc. Um, yeah, our, our, unfortunately our daughter's been sick on and off for the past month, and it's just been like... Uh, it's really just screwed up my own schedule, because you're just like in... It's like you're fighting a forest fire or something. It's just constant, like... Um, struggle to um, to get sleep in and all it's just it's exhausting long story short so I haven't had much of a chance to even think she's doing much better she, I think I mean knock on wood we've thought that a few times but uh, I think she's doing better now so but just on a very limited diet to try to get her back but it's I think that's the reality of having kids is that Every time they go to school, they get sick, right? So I haven't spent much time thinking about the... To answer your question, I was going to go out and get some chocolate Easter eggs this afternoon, and we went down to the beach, and... Which was great, and... And then kind of ran out of time, and then I was like, oh my goodness, it's like 3.15. It's going to take us half an hour just to get home, and i got to change. And so... So 
still yes, and I do not have any plans as of yet. Wipe it out and start it again. Those fingers looked so long. Just shrink them down just a tad. That butt is very clenched. Poor Albion. Maybe he, uh, maybe he caught the same thing my daughter has or had. Stuff coming out both ends.
you know, as I'm painting, I'm getting kind of lazier and lazier, and my lines are getting wider and wider. So it's just... Uh, Just something to be mindful of, you know. I'm I'm gonna just plow ahead and finish the painting. But, you know, if I was if this was my own painting, I probably would have stopped a little bit earlier. Oops, I'm not on the camera. Let that sit there while I paint elsewhere. Um, there's Tempera says hi. John says happy Easter to all of you. Love you guys so much. Lolly says all. Oh, Ah, uh, poor sweet girl. I hope your daughter's better soon. Sending love to you guys. Uh, what emoji is that, John? I can't tell what the honor that is. Um, uh, Sanju says, hello, Michael. It's Sanju from Mary Meritius. Meritius. Uh, nice to see a live session. John says, that naked figure must be a soldier who pierced him back oldies day. Uh, it does sort of look like maybe the soldier that stabbed Jesus when he was on the cross. Um, uh, but um, according to William Blake himself, this is sort of, it's a... Definitely a, a uh, it's his own, pro not I don't know, his own projection, he, it's his own kind of retelling, incorporating Christ into a totally different universe of characters that belong exclusively to William Blake, which makes is why William Blake is just such a far out character. Is that, um, yes, we have the crucifixion happening here, but uh, this person is is part of William Blake's own mythology this character Albion who is the is sort of like all of humanity 
or the Western world anyway, and um, yeah, very odd. Yeah, I, I, I talked earlier at length all about it, but um, so of course, yes, it does share similarities with the biblical story. But it's also, I mean, here we have Jesus nailed to the the tree of knowledge, as opposed to um, a crucifix. Right? Is it the crucifix, right? Nailed to a cross, right? Is it is it what is a crucifix? Is a crucifix a cross of, upon which someone is nailed to? You know, sometimes you say a word and then you're like, is that the right word? I'm going to explain this away that the lines are all thicker and stuff down at the bottom, not due to my own uh, sloppiness as I get tired and my eyes get more and more crossed, but that uh, the bright light emanating from Jesus is um, creating harsh shadows that are meaning that one side of his body is much darker than the other. Okay, see, there's a big blob of paint that just fell off my brush up here. So let's just take a deep breath and just clean that up and wipe it away. I don't even know where that came from, to be honest. Where did it? It's like it fell from the sky. Sanju says, uh, yes, I'm in the Indian Ocean, very, very far away. Uh, are your canvases A4 size? I can't remember exactly how big A4 is. 
um, but it's 9 by 12 inches. Um, A4, if I recall, is slightly more narrow and a little bit longer. I, off the top of my head, I bet you A4 is probably something like 8.5 by 12? Is that what it, eight, eight, eight and a half by, or maybe eight by eleven and a half? It's something like that. I remember when I was a student at the Royal College in England. Um, uh, you know, all my none of my papers would fit in my binder because I had I brought you know binder out there with me and it wouldn't. Uh, I had to buy a separate binder, long story short. Because <laughs> paper is a little bit different in North America than it is in other places. Who would have thought, right? You know, in, in now in retrospect, probably what I should have done instead of using black is made this, and I, I didn't make you know I mixed my own black here, and I guess I did too good of a job, but uh, um, I probably would have been. It would have made sense to maybe have a little bit more, not a gray, but a. Um, Maybe a slightly more blue or red or maybe even a dark brown. So it's not quite so solid, so black. Um, but, you know, live and learn, right? It's it's not a, not a, the end of the world. Maybe I'm going to turn this like that. And... Uh, Sanju says, uh, "Do you, you know you do your printing in A4 size for image transfer?" Uh, no, I print on eight and a half by eleven paper. We don't. There's not a name for it in North America. Like A4 is just called eight and a half by eleven inches. Um, that's the standard out here. But. Uh, I mean, for all intents and purposes, very, very similar. Oops, what did I just do? Ooh, shakes. Hope I didn't affect the stream there at all. <laughs> just tapping away on buttons and computer and meow. Okay, this is tricky. What am I looking at? I think I gotta go to my own illustration here.
happened to this guy's nose? Now all this is where a little bit of underpainting would have made all the difference, Michael. Sorry, I know my big head keeps getting in the way. Story of my life. Now don't be too concerned about making it look good from this angle. I've made that that mistake sometimes. Sometimes, you know, I've I've done a painting and painted it upside down and you're like, "Wow, it looks great like this." And then you turn it the right side and you're like, "Whoa. Huh. Well, that's not what I was hoping it was going to look like." So I'm just going to get a little bit more of this done and then turn it right side up. And then that'll give me a clear idea of how good of a job I did. Because of course people aren't going to look, or I'm not going to look at this painting from this angle. Right? Okay, so I'm going to blow dry this, and I'm going to darken a few places, especially on his back there. And that's stuff that I wouldn't have, I, I didn't know I needed until I got to this stage. And that's why sometimes, you know, we're kind of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. So let's blow dry this.
Okay. Um, I'm going to do a little bit more line work. I'm gonna, uh, actually, maybe this time I'm going to dilute this. You see how sometimes like I, I mix the paint and then I wipe my brush clean because sometimes the paint builds up onto the brush there like that so What's going on? I can't even focus. So this is, you know, a, just another black line, but it's, uh, I've put a significant amount of, of glazing fluid in there just to thin it, or to make it a little bit more transparent.
I don't know if I needed to do that. It might have might have been kind of a little self-explanatory, so I'm just gonna dab a bit of that up. You know what, I think, um, before I do that... Okay, so let's do some finishing touches and wrap up. I knew this was going to be a longer one, so none of this is a surprise to me anyway. Um, okay, I want to get just the last little bit on here, the shadows on... Albion's body. Okay, let's, uh, let's darken that again.
Okay. I hope, am I still live here? I haven't seen a comment in a while and it always makes me a little anxious. Well, I'll find out soon enough. Usually not a good sign when I, is anybody, if, is anybody actually, is this working? If somebody could leave a comment, that would be awesome, because there were lots more people a few minutes ago, and then nothing's happened, and so that usually suggests that something's gone horribly wrong. Must have done something if it's not working. But no one's leaving a comment that tells me that something happened.
Hmm. Okay. I'm just going to check and see if this is working or not. Tackle it all with Heli Hansen Workwear at Mark's. It seems to be working. I'm not sure why all of a sudden if anybody's watching if you could leave a comment because I'm not sure what uh, all of a sudden there were, everyone disappeared no one's leaving comments so it makes me wonder what's going on here anyway I'm just gonna keep doing my thing okay so let's uh, let's move on here I mean, I checked the video. It looks like it's still playing on YouTube. So, whatever's going on, whoever's watching just decides not to comment. Okay, that's okay. Okay, so we're at that point in the episode where we're going to do a side by side comparison. Um, just before we do so, of course, please consider hitting the like button, hitting the subscribe button, and the notification bell so you know when future episodes are about to happen. I, this, is not a new, this is not a usual time for me to be streaming. Also, consider leaving a donation, a PayPal link uh, down below. You can use the YouTube Super Chat, although YouTube takes like 40% of whatever you donate. So, uh, send, sending by PayPal or e-transfer by email, contact me through my email, which is on my damn, or on my website, or on the Facebook group, and speaking of which, join the Facebook group, there is, this is an awesome uh, group of, you know, there's almost 800 people now, that is awesome, so let me see if there's any comment here about no, no one's saying anything's going wrong, so whatever. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's do a side by side comparison here. Okay, obviously they they look a little bit different. Um, I decided to really I really liked these radiating beams of light and really decided to accentuate that part of this painting and. I'm happy that I did. I think that uh, it's definitely a little bit different. Um, but different is okay, right? So, um, there's also, you know, I my outlining is a little bit heavy-handed. So we have a bit more of a cartoony kind of feel to this painting that, you know, had I just... I could have stopped maybe an hour and a half ago and not done the outlines, and I think it would have been just as fine. But um, it is what it is. It's not, not it doesn't ruin the painting, but it also just makes it a little bit different, right? So let's zoom in on a few things here. Um, actually, let's. Yeah, let's start down here. Let's go all the way to the left. Let's go all the way to the bottom. Let's just go right down here. Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, the colors are... You know, I, I guess I could have gone even darker here. Maybe even this is a bit more of a brownish black, but it's also remember I, I was brown there for a while, and these layers of black I put over are pretty subtle. 
I think actually in person it's much closer to what I'm seeing on screen, but whatever. Um, got that leg, bottom of the body here. Oh, there's Pascaline leaving a comment. Okay, so it is working. Good. Thank you for leaving a comment, Pascaline. Um, okay, let's go up here. Yeah, that looks okay. I mean, these kind of the stripes that I put on the body. Obviously, his are way more subtle and super detailed. Um, done with a very, very fine uh, point on an etching plate. Um, and, you know, a person could do that with a paintbrush. You could see how kind of sloppy and lazy I got here as my eyes started to become more and more cross and I lost sight of those details. Um, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way this fella turned out down here. Let's sort of work our way up the tree of knowledge. Those legs, same sort of thing. He's there, this area is way darker, and I think if I had darkened the tree next to Christ, I think these black lines themselves wouldn't be so... Um, wouldn't pop so much. Um, the fact that the rest of the background is is kind of muted is what makes those black lines like very different than any, anything else, right? So these figures tend they they seem to kind of emerge forward in a way that they don't in the original. Um, I will say, like, his Jesus, you know, the, the expression on, on his version, Blake's version, he looks kind of sad, and whereas my figure is sort of a little, not quite as, uh, Feel like he's kind of a little bit more just a little bit more of a blank expression um again you make a decision which one you prefer i, I don't know what to say uh the hands um i made a decision when i was outlining to kind of define the hands a little more than he had his sort of disappeared so, again, you can decide whether you like the way I did these hands or not. I actually kind of like the way he did that hand on the right here. I think actually works quite well. Um, versus mine where I've, I've identified the individual fingers, maybe less so. I could paint that more red, but I, I, I'm happy with the way the painting looks. Um, you know, a feature of his painting is the, the tree branches and the oak leaves and everything hanging off this side. Um, that would have been something I sh if I was wanting to do that, that would have been in the initial outline and drawing that on before I even started anything else. And I made a conscious decision just to eliminate those, which does make this shape, this tree, a little bit more ambiguous. I mean, it could be, a, I don't know, a, a, a mountain, you know, like the some sort of... Um, you know, like a land bridge, you know, like that uh, you see in like the Grand Canyon that every once in a while some somebody knocks down, right? Um, as opposed to a tree. The other thing, you know, I, I actually, I like what I've done. I'm not, I'm going to keep it like that. But I, I will say that 
what William Blake has done, it has a bit more of a, how would you say, like, the way that it, it they're not radiating outwards, they kind of radiate out and then come down, like, almost like a, uh, a firework or something, right, where we've got this versus this going out in every direction. Um, it's, uh, different, just, just different, you know, so, um, yeah, I think that, uh, that brings me to the end, I think I can walk away from this one feeling pretty happy, and I hope you feel happy too, thank you everyone for painting along with me, I can't wait to see what you've done in today's, during today's episode, whether you painted this version of William Blake's Crucifixion, um, or if you've done something else entirely and you're just watching or painting along with me doing something else, please take a photograph, upload it to the Facebook group so that we can celebrate what you've done today. I think anytime anyone's doing anything creative, you're doing the world a service and you're helping to make the world a better place. So on behalf of myself and everyone else, um, who wants to live in a better world, thank you for, for being creative and, and, uh, taking a bit of a risk, because it's always a bit of a risk when you make something, when you when you create something that it won't work out. But every artwork's a learning experience, and we're growing no matter what the results may initially appear. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you guys in um, a couple of days. On Sunday, we're going to be doing the another William Blake painting. We're going to be doing the Resurrection. So here's the Crucifixion. A couple of days later. Christ for Rises, and we're going to be doing that painting also by William Blake. I can't wait to see you then. Have a great night, everybody. Happy Easter. We'll see you again very soon. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.